eventually technology catches up and the fantastical can sometimes become very plausible and may even become factual. We are with E.A. Smeraldo. She is a novelist, a musician, and a nuclear engineer. And there's her book, The Silent Count. And in it, she infuses real climate science and imagines many different possibilities. E.A., hello. Welcome to the Book Fest. Thanks so much. Nice to see you. I think we're going to have a fun conversation because, and there's a bit of a theme with the book fest this time around too. Uh, later on this afternoon, for example, we're having a panel discussion about AI and how artificial intelligence is disrupting not only different areas of the world, but the writing world, definitely, especially content writing. And, you know, it's just things are changing so, so fast. And I feel like that's a big part of what we can talk about here. Um, any any thoughts on AI and artificial intelligence? I know you're a nuclear engineer and that's not quite your wheelhouse, but I'm just kind of curious. You know, AI does make a, it makes a secret appearance in my novel uh, and without any, any spoilers, um, uh, the main character thinks that something is being done by this, bot that's an AI uh, construction, but perhaps it's not. <laughs> so perhaps there's actual malice going afoot, you know? So yeah, so I, I have incorporated it. I think that um, anyone who is really pretty much any, any type of techno thriller or, um, you know, science fiction book, it, it's, it's, you're going to have to face it that AI is just, it's, it, Five years from now, we're not even going to be talking about it as a, as a, you know, this uh, esoteric thing. It's probably going to be pervasive, and and kids are probably going to be encouraged to use it to help them with their homework. Yeah, that's my. Well, I know, you're there first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. There's a lot of controversy about you know, schools and universities everywhere. You know, don't use AI. Kids can't use AI, and then I have to just stop and think and. And it's like, you know what? I remember when I was a kid and I was taught the metric system because that was going to take over the world. And I had to learn the Dewey Decimal System. And gosh darn it, if I didn't know how to use that scientific calculator and algebra. And now we really don't need it because we do have the computers doing it for us. So <laughs> as long as you are able to think, do you really, really, you know, need to have that skill set? You know, I just wonder sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us in your book, The Silent Count, it's predicated on real science. And that actually came from your time at, in, as a college student. Can you tell us what inspired the book? Sure. Um, I hold here in my hands my actual nuclear engineering textbook from college that inspired this whole journey that I've taken uh, writing The Silent Count. And it's the second edition of the book which uh, on the first page, it, it literally says that you can use nuclear weapons to do things like uh, create harbors, um, you know, extract oil from shale, and even to eliminate certain mountain ranges to create more favorable weather patterns. I could not make something like that up. It says that on the first page. Now, they aren't recommending we do this. And in my novel, I don't recommend we do this either. But it is it is real science that could actually work. Um, it, it has been employed not by the Americans. Um, you know, there was a big project in the 50s called Pl Project Plowshares initiated by President Eisenhower, where they were looking at peaceful applications for nuclear power, nuclear weapons. Um, the Soviets had a similar program. And they were using nuclear weapons to build artificial lakes and things like that. So, uh, this is this is not anything new. Actually, it's uh, it's been around. And my novel is set slightly in the future, where things with climate change get so bad that um, I think the uh, that's the only step they can think of that might actually save us. So, um, anyway, that that's what I, I you know as I was in college. Further, further along, uh, you started hearing more about global warming, and then I thought, what about the intersection of those two possibilities? That might make a great science fiction novel, and someone should write it, and no one did. So here I am. 
And here you are. You're the one who wrote it. And you're a DC native too. So there's, you know, a lot of intrigue and, you know, questions about leadership and uh, your protagonist. She is somebody whose voice isn't necessarily heard a lot. Can you talk about your experience and your environment in Washington, DC and the, how that influenced writing the book? Yes. Well, first of all, um, I am a DC native. Uh, my, you know, my parents weren't uh, in the government, but a lot of people we knew were. And if they weren't, they worked for somebody who, uh, you know, they, my dad was a barber, he cut people's hair who, you know, worked for the government. So we knew a lot of people in that world and politics, you know, become very important when your livelihood kind of depends on the cycles that, that happen. Um, yeah, you know, uh, my first job actually, when I was in high school, I worked for the Naval Research Laboratory and I would, I worked in the chemistry lab, I was a lab assistant, uh, I did a little project. And you know, you think it was really boring washing bottles, but that summer, one of the chemists won a freaking Nobel Prize. So I think it, it just kind of really captured my imagination. And he had, you know, his wife was a scientist and all three of his daughters were chemists. And I would just think of, wow, there, you know, this predated the Incredibles, but I thought, wow, you know, they should be out fighting crime and doing all kinds of interesting things with science. And it just kind of inspired me to, um, to just, just really think out of the, out of the, the day to day. So um, yeah, science, yeah. it has that effect on people. And I, I know that it did with me, but the, you know, the politics gets wrapped up in it because, you know, Congress has to approve your budget and, they have different priorities every year. So here we are all these years later, climate change is afoot and people are still arguing about what to do about it. Yeah, exactly. And you are a thinker and somebody who has had all of those experience. What do you think besides what's going on with the current situation, climate change, and just, you know, science in general, what do you think also might impact us soon. Let's, let's get out EA's crystal ball. Any, any <laughs> predictions on the horizon? Well, um, you know, uh, people are going to fight tooth and nail uh, to keep the status quo. You know, I think not just in the United States, but there's many countries, their entire, as we're seeing, their, you know, their entire um, GDP is based on fossil fuel production and so forth. Um, I like to think that there can be a way to uh, to create, you know, sound, uh, sustainable futures for ourselves with energy where you can use fossil fuels. I like to think that maybe there's a carbon capture system down the pike. Mm -hmm. You know, I have so much faith in the in the young people of today and their capabilities that um, my hope is that that they'll they'll help us help us through this because uh, yeah there's uh, there's certainly and there's certainly a lot of great ideas um, there's a lot of ideas that you wonder about I you know can't help but wonder yes you know in California I understand that the you know electric vehicles will be required by a, a few years from now. But um, I was just in California. I visited Palm Springs, a wonderful place. I don't think I saw very many uh, charging stations for these vehicles. So here's hoping that um, somebody gets on the ball and starts building that infrastructure. I know we've got, uh, you know, we've got people hopefully working on that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is one of the bright sides, I think, is that it provides opportunity provides job it provides you know yes. a stimulation in the economy so you know you, you can look at the glass half full or half empty but there's also positives with changing over the way we're doing things I mean once upon a time there was people that were saying uh-uh I've got my horseshoeing business here <laughs> you're not going to take that away from me with that automobile and you know it just technology moves on and you mentioned the young people. Well, they're the ones that are going to be living in this mess. So, yeah, ho and ho hopefully some of the older folks help them out a little bit, too, because I, I don't think that's entirely fair to them. But, um, OK, I'm going to ask you maybe a little bit of a, a provocative question. In your experience, is there anything that you know of that the average person might be shocked or surprised to know? Anything like that. There is. 
There is. Um, so one of the other very inspiring books that I read when I was coming up as a nuclear engineer was The Making of the Atomic Bomb by Richard Rhodes. It's uh, sort of a classic in the um, in the the field of nuclear history. And it's a, it's a wonderful book. It reads like a thriller. But one of the things that really struck me was that, um, you know, the people that worked on the Manhattan Project where they developed the, the nuclear weapons, one of the, the pioneers, the person who actually advised the president to set up the Manhattan Project was, a, was an acquaintance and fan of the work of H.G. Wells, a science fiction author. And H.G. Wells, in his, his book was called, one of his books was called The World Set Free. And in The World Set Free, he predicted the atomic bomb. He predicted what he called a, a uranium based great grenade that when you threw it would have a chain reaction. So um, some people do believe that, um, and, and Leo Szilard is the, the scientist, he was a Hungarian American scientist who uh, set this up, who helped set up the Manhattan Project. Um, you know, he, he was the one who uh, was sort of like the, the God, one of the godfathers of chain, nuclear chain reactions. So, um, it's it's quite possible that science fiction actually did inspire science fact in ways that I don't think most people are aware of. Right, right. That's so cool. I didn't know that. Thanks. That's yes. that's great book fast trivia for everybody. We all just learned something yeah. really cool there. Yeah, H.G. Wells, definitely, definitely one of the best. Um, now, wh why don't you talk a little bit about some of the other creative outlets that you have really quick? Because I know you're a musician, too, and you infuse the music, like your original music, into your book as well. Talk about that really quick. Yes, um, I am a songwriter. I am a guitar playing fool, and I uh, as I'm a singer. And you know the Washington D.C. is very fertile grounds for for musicians. It's got it's got every kind of music you can think of. Um, you know, I think um, Roy, Roy Clark, the great guitar player and country bluegrass musician, was from here, and uh, I think Count Basie was from nearby. And so so lots of lots of great. Uh, and of course the the punk scene, bands like Minor Threat. You know, if you've heard of Henry Rollins, who was with Black Flag. He was from here originally. So there, there's a fertile ground for musicians. So I grew up with all this and um, Go Go is another one, Experience Limited, Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers. So lots of great music. But um, anyway, so I, I just had a lot of music in my head and uh, just loved to write songs. And so I had a band for quite some time. I was nominated for a Washington Area Music Award. And my novel is just filled with uh, song lyrics because one of the main characters is a musician who starts out as an indie rocker and uh, achieves quite a bit of fame and that's one of the running themes of the novel you know it's uh, who's going to get this idea out to people is it the artist or is it the scientists and there's a little bit of a push-pull with that I love that I love that and that's such a salient point okay E.A. Smeraldo author of The Silent Count let us know really quick what you got going on on the horizon because I think you're going to be at a very cool event soon. Is that right? Yes, I'm going to be signing books at the LA Festival, the LA Times Festival of Books in Los Angeles on um, USC campus. I'll be there on April 23rd, which is a Sunday from one to three. So I, I hope if anyone's in the in California, Southern California, and wants to stop by, I would love to meet you, love to sign your book. Uh, so there's that, um, you know, just just a lot of a lot of crazy stuff going on. I guess uh, I'm trying to write my sequel. There is going to be a sequel to The Silent Count. There's a nice. lot more, a lot more worlds that need saving. <laughs> uh, so yeah, not to give any spoilers, but yeah, there's there's some work left to be done. So that the, there will be something uh, something on the horizon, and um, yeah, just uh, I, I'm judging some contests for. Uh, I'm judging novel contests sponsored by the nice. a climate fiction novel contest sponsored by the uh, University of Southampton in the UK. So there's there's a lot going on. Awesome. And that is booth 153 in the yellow zone that you are going to be in at the Los yeah. Angeles Times Festival of Books. E.A. Smeraldo, author of The Silent Count. Thank you for being with us on the Book Fest. Thanks so much for having me.